Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Lord, as we open your word, I ask that you will teach us that we will see we will see your beauty, your love, your grace, your patience with us. Thank you so much because we pray in Jesus' name, amen. amen. I wanna read the scripture reading which is from Acts, the first chapter. I'm gonna read several verses, uh, follow if you wish, but listen very well. Acts chapter one, and I am beginning from uh, verse five here. This is written by Luke, by the way, the doctor. And he wrote Acts, but he also wrote the book of Luke. And he's speaking here, it, it, this is a historical record actually, but he's speaking here to a man named Theophilus of what Jesus did. And so the first, uh, the first uh, verses of this are saying that Jesus went through the crucifixion and so forth, and then he was with the disciples for 40 days. But then I'm starting in, uh, in uh, verse four. It says, Jesus was there as being assembled together with them, he commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, have heard of me. For John truly baptized, that's John the Baptist, with water. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? By the way, this was the big deal with the disciples. They always thought, Judas thought, Judas was the prime one. He wanted Jesus to be the king of Israel. That's where he went off the tracks. He thought that he could engineer things and force Jesus to take over Jerusalem, to be the ruler, to take care of the Romans. After all, I mean, Jesus could speak the word and he could heal people that died or raise them to, Jesus could do anything. And so he wanted to have political influence. And so this same thing comes up here in Acts. They asked, Lord, when are you gonna set up your kingdom? Jesus said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria unto the uttermost parts of the world. You are going to be the ones that go out and you will receive power. But it's not the power that Judas was thinking of. While they looked steadfastly into heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel which said, ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is called Jerusalem, a day's journey. When they were come in, they went into an upper room where abode both Peter and James and John and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and the disciples. Okay, now I want you to picture this in your minds. I suspect that this upper room, that this is the little dormitory where the disciples were when they had the communion service, when the foot washing, when Jesus was with them. Remember that was at the time of the Passover and it was a time just before the crucifixion. Remember that they'd been sent to find a room and they've served the meal there and so forth. And I suspect here that, and they walked around, you know, with blankets or something, a shawl over their shoulders when they wanted to lie down at night. 
They would sleep wherever they were. This was outdoors. I mean, they didn't have an RV to, to stay in. And so they go to this room, and this is where the disciples were. And it says, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples, the number being about 120. Did they go outside? Were they down in the courtyard? And he says, men and brethren, this scripture must needs to have been fulfilled with the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake concerning Judas. And he goes through that. And it says here, going further, that they, I'm going to the end of this now, it says that they prayed, uh, Peter spoke, and then this mighty, mighty word, uh, 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 rushing wind comes chapter 2 says when the day of Pentecost was fully come they were all with one accord in one place and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a mighty rushing wind it filled all the house where they were sitting there appeared unto them cloven tongues as of fire and they sat on each one of them they were all filled with the Holy Ghost began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. I'm gonna stop there. And I want to emphasize just a couple things going forward. Number one, I want you to see here that the disciples were commissioned to work. They were commissioned to take the gospel. He said, you'll go to the uttermost parts of the world. Then he told them, he says, don't go now. Go to that upper room and begin to pray. And they prayed. And they settled scores. Remember, they were asking who is going to be the leader? Who is going to be in charge? Who are the ones that are, that are going to take over after you leave? This was their theme all through the time that they had followed Jesus around Judea. Jesus said, no, you wait, you go and pray. And the reason I say this is I believe at this time in Earth's history that we have to begin to pray. We have to find that upper room. We have to be together We've got some confessing to do, some repenting to do. Now we will do this in different ways. The reason I say this, and I'm gonna tell you a little of my background. I'm an American. I look like one. I may sound a little bit different because I was born overseas in India. I speak three other languages besides English. You can find me on YouTube sp speaking Punjabi. I, I told someone here this morning that I went to get my driver's license renewed recently, just a few weeks ago. And uh, the lady that was across the counter from me at DMV was Punjabi. And I walked up, and of course, I wanted to have as much traction as I could, so I spoke to her and said something in English, and then I switched to Punjabi, and she says, what? <laughs> <laughs> she looks at me hard, and she said, I know you. Where did I see you? And suddenly she smiles, she said, that was on YouTube, right? You're the one that was George Johnson, Punjabi. I said, yes, I'm that guy. I, I chuckled. I figured this battle is half over. And I was a little bit fearful. I wear glasses now. And I can read fine. I, I can read here. That's no problem. 
but uh, my left eye is a little bit weaker than the right one. And I hate facing trucks with their bright lights at night. I mean, they've got lights that are just super, super. I felt like, I, I wish I had a BB gun to just <laughs> pop those out when they come <laughs> blinding me, you know, with those lights. In fact, I, I, I wish I could go to the governor or something and say, have a law about this. I don't like laws, but I would say, you better check all those guys that, that have those glaring lights. Um, anyway, this lady got so worked up, she forgot to give me the eye examination. <laughs> when I walked out, I was just, I lifted my hands to heaven. I said, thank you, Jesus. I don't know what would have happened, but I've got a good eye. I can see fine, and I'm not going to be driving much at night. But Lord in heaven, you've been good to me. Anyway, uh, here you have it. I want to introduce another subject which should be looked at here. That is... I studied history in, in college. I was sent off to boarding school in India when I was eight years of age. It's just a little guy, cocky. There were <laughs> Sikhs and Punjabis and all this all around. And uh, my sister had polio when she was seven. She'd gone to school a year before I did, uh, the boarding school. And I was tough on my mother. She tried to teach me, then she got a teacher, and that didn't work too well. We were living several hundred miles away from where the school was, the boarding school. So the next year they sent me. 19, what was it? It was probably 1950, 52, something like that. You know, I had a ball. I didn't like discipline. And uh, I had learned to read. And my education, basically, if I got into class, I'd mess up and I would do my own thing. And I, uh, they didn't spare the rod in those days. I had a lot of hidings, a lot of problems with my rear end. Uh, there were times I'd put on two sets of, of shorts, you know, underwear, just to make sure that I didn't get hurt too bad. But I'd learned to read, and I loved to read. And there were times when I didn't like what the subject was, so I'd read, I'd go to town every month, they give us a town day, and I'd buy books. My allowance went into books. And... Uh, because of that, years later, I studied history. I didn't plan to be a pastor at all. I wanted to use my Punjabi. I really wanted to end up in the State Department of the United States and to become a diplomat. I knew I could make money. I had an accent that was really good. Nobody could learn Punjabi here in the States like I knew it from being over there. And. Uh, because of that education of mine, by the way, I took the exams to go into the State Department. I thought for a while of going into the CIA, but I figured that might be a bit risky. <laughs> but, but I took the exams. I didn't want to work for God. I wanted to make money. I wanted to be independent. I wanted to live the good life. My dad took me down to the area in Washington, D.C. I was studying then, back there. And um, my parents were at the general conference. He took me down to this area where the diplomats were, and he introduced me to an Adventist man who had left the church. He had an affair while he was overseas. My dad knew him. He spoke the languages. And he'd finally become the ambassador of the United States to Afghanistan. 
He's the one that set the foundation stone there on the embassy. I've seen it many times when I was in Afghanistan. And I, it's probably blown away. I mean, you know, Afghanistan has had the fighting going on. There were always bombs and this and that going off. So I, I presume that that's tumbled. The man came out from the office to meet my father. And I looked at him and his face was debauched. It was swollen. I could tell he was a drinker. I could tell, I could see cigars on his desk and alcohol and all of this stuff. And I was repulsed. I, I was 18, 20 years of age and I looked at him and I said in my heart, I will never look like that. I asked him questions about Sabbath. He said, what are you gonna do if the president comes that day? You can have Saturday off. What are you gonna do when you're taken to Bangkok for courses and all the young guys head down to Pat Pong, the nightlife place of, of Bangkok? You're gonna be the one that stands out, doesn't do things, you're gonna be with the guys. And I remember walking away that day and I said, you know what? I'm not going down that road. I was so thankful for my Adventist background. To this day, I've never eaten meat. I mean, I'd just soon eat a dead dog as eat beef or anything. I don't want that stuff in my mouth. Um, I drank two cups of coffee once going into Bombay after 20 hour, 24 hour flight, thinking I could make the last four hours in a taxi, <laughs> going to the division office if I take took a couple of, uh, of cups of coffee. I had a weak stomach. A Couple of days later, I was bleeding in my stomach. I tell you, I never tried coffee again. Anyway, you know, here I was, six weeks later, I got a call to go to India and to teach at a school there. It was where I was born. My wife wanted to be a missionary. She had asked me many times, she knew I was a missionary kid, she asked many times, you gonna go back? And I say yes, but I didn't say I was gonna go back to be a missionary. Anyway, she was a nurse, we ended up going, but not to India, we went to Pakistan. India was not giving visas to missionaries. This I'm gonna say very quickly, after that, I was put in as a, a school principal in Pakistan, 400 students. We went through war. We went through difficult experiences. But God met me in Afghanistan on the road that the troops now called Suicide Alley. It's a, it's a road that goes from Peshawar, which is the northern city in Pakistan, you go through the Khyber Pass, it's just a narrow area where the troops, where the Alexander the Great came through there, the Mughal emperors came through there. Pakistan and India are fertile places, it's like the San Joaquin Valley. And up in the hills, it was hard, there's rocks, there's rivers, they grow fruit, they just grow wonderful things up in Afghanistan. But India, it's now one point, what is it, four billion people. Uh, no, it, it's, it's uh, I think, 14. Anyway, we're ahead of China now with India. And uh, billions and billions of people. We were there on that road. There was a sheer drop off into the river. On this side, rock going up, it was a cliff, you know, but they had carved, the, the Americans had actually made the road, carved this into the side of the mountain. And here I come around the corner with three other people, my wife with me, and there's a huge rock in the middle of the road. And I couldn't do this because the river was below. I knew that if I blew the tires either side that I was in trouble, but I knew I was not gonna go over the cliff. And I hit that rock and the car bounced and went up in the air. 
came down on the other side and it kept running. And here I was and I'm searching my heart and I'm thinking to myself, you know what? What happened underneath? The tires were still okay. The engine ran. I ran that afternoon for two hours. I didn't stop. I was praying. I, I knew that I was in trouble. And I was thinking to myself, I'm a Jonah. Actually, the, the union president was sitting in the back. It was his car. And he had been saying to me, George, I want you to be ordained. I want you to be a pastor. And I kept saying, no, I'm not ready. I'm going to, in my heart, I thought I'll stay a, a couple of years and then I'm going to leave. That evening, the lights were going on in Kabul and we drove in and we parked at the hotel. I opened my door, grabbed a flashlight and I knelt down on my knees to see what was there. As I watched all the oil in the pan dropped out on the road and it took about 15, 20 seconds and all the oil was gone. There was a gash in the pan that big that the rock had carved. I had driven with the hole there for two hours and the car had never stopped. The hair on the back of my neck, my arms, it just stood up. I walked up to the room saying not much, but again, I said, I'm a, I'm a Jonah. I'm a Jonah. How did he save me? How did he save my wife? The next day, Behind a donkey, we pulled, that was the wrecker in Kabul, we pulled that car. And some guys lifted the, the motor area up, put bricks underneath it. They took, they took uh, carbide, they made their own gas there, they had some oxygen. They welded that, put another bolt in there. We were there three, four hours, got it fixed, went home. I didn't sleep well. In three or four days time, I made up my mind. I went to Pastor Lang. I said to him, I said, I'm willing. I'll become a pastor. I was giving up those dreams of mine. The reason I tell you this story I want you to know, by the way, since then, that God has been wonderful to me. I know again and again, he has saved my life. He's directed us. In many ways, I tell people I've walked on the high, the high areas, the high places of the earth. I've enjoyed what God gave me. I'm working right now for the conference. I don't accept since 2009, I haven't tried to take salary from anybody. I'm retired. We live up here in the hills. My grandfather was, uh, had only one child, my mother. So we we're able to live there on 800 acres of property. I look down in Millerton Lake. And uh, when we walk to the top of the hill, it's a cattle ranch. By the way, I'll give you a tip about being cool in the, uh, in the summer, because I lived in the east for a while. I've got a basement under the house there at the ranch. And uh, yesterday I went down to the basement when it was 90, 95, whatever it was in the sun. Down to the basement, it's always 75. So just a little clue, if you go down and stay with the gophers and all of that under the... <laughs> I, I told somebody in Costco they were selling air conditioners. I said, I got better than that. You don't have to pay PG&E. All you do is put a basement under your house. 
And by the way, Pakistan, I've seen 126 in the shade. So, I mean, I don't like hot, hot uh, uh, climate. But, you know, looking at the world today with my education, I know Jesus is coming. I'm not fooling around. My master's degree was in British Empire history. I know of all the wars. I can tell you how many men, Americans, died the first day of D-Day. Some 2,400 and something men died in the water there when they were landing at Normandy. I know who supplied, you know that America was supplying tanks and <laughs> they were supplying planes and everything to Russia during World War II because the Russians, they didn't have the armaments that we did. We had factories that could just turn out women and men, you know, were working in those factories making bombers and all this stuff. There's never been a time in this world when we're so messed up as we are today. I'm an American. I tell you this, I don't even know who to vote for in the next election. You think about it. Do you know who is supporting Trump? The Protestants in America. There's a book written by a pastor's son, uh, I think a Baptist, and he's a reporter. This book is something called The Power and the Glory, and basically it's the conservative, and most are, are Protestants, churches that support that, that program. How can I vote for a rapist? How can I vote for somebody that's dishonest? I'm not going political, I'm just saying as an Adventist, what do I do? Satan's got the world by the throat. Who would think that there'd be war right now in Israel and Gaza? Who would think that the Jews who were persecuted so terribly during World War II would be dropping bombs and killing hundreds of thousands of people. That's unthinkable. Who would think that Russia is expanding now into Ukraine, which used to be part of Russia, and that we're being threatened by nuclear weapons and so forth? Who would think that willy-nilly here in our country, you can go to a ball game or you can go to school or you go, and somebody's going to shoot you down? This was the country that was the land of freedom for the pilgrims and for our people years ago. My people came from Denmark because they were hungry. My wife's people came from Russia. They were Germans in Russia. They had gone there 200 years before to teach ag and to make ships for you know, the czars. They left when they were hungry. They left when war came. They came to California. I'm just saying, Jesus is coming. The world is screaming that at us. China, nuclear stuff, North Korea, you name it. I want to go back now to the book of Acts. Jesus said to the disciples, he said, don't go out yet. You go and you pray. That's the prep for the Holy Spirit. You pray. And I'm just going to tell you what what I'm doing, I, Pastor Cerns asked me to go down to Bakersfield a couple of years ago. I went down, there's been uh, problems in that church, the big church here in, in uh, Central Cal. 
And going down, I thought to myself, the only thing I, people, for 12 years it had been broken and pastors would leave. The last pastor before me stayed a year and got out. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, the only thing that's gonna work down there is love. I asked to stay with a family and they took me in, wonderful people, very hospitable. I had a bedroom there. I called my hostess the Shunammite. Do you remember the Shunammite? And she built that little room for the prophet. She would always chuckle. I'd say, Shunammite, I'm coming down. And she'd laugh at me. And uh, she and her husband were godly people. At night, they'd sit down and study the Bible quietly, each in their own worship. And uh, Sabbath would come. And they'd have a nice meal. They'd ask me to come. Sometimes it was a potluck at the church, but they'd sit, beautiful food, nice meal. And then they'd visit all afternoon with their friends. I got really uncomfortable with that thought to myself, I'm, I'm a pastor. And I called the people, the dissidents, the ones that, that were not cooperating, I called them and said, I've got to visit people, bring me a car, I'm gonna go visiting elderly people. It broke my heart, some of them had been laying there in those beds, no family left. I'd walk in, here's this elderly lady, by the way, I'm only 80. I just had my birthday. But uh, here's a lady that's 90, 95, and nobody's been there for a while. I take her hand. She starts telling me. Her husband's gone. She got into the church when he came back from World War II and so forth. Lonely people. I went into one rest, rest uh, home and here's a lady, I thought she was our Adventist sister and she turned out to be Italian and she starts talking to me in half English and half Italian and they said, no, you, the lady you're visiting is such and such. And I still remember this little Italian lady, she's hanging on to me and I'm trying to go to that room to visit. There were about 12 people in that church that would go out on Sabbath and pass out great controversy. They'd bring sack lunches. Then they'd go out, pass this out. You guys get the picture. In the end, God works some miracles. All I did was love. I preached, yes. You know, we looked at the policies and so forth, but I had to love. At the end of my stay there, my hostess, the woman of Shunem, she lost her son to suicide. I was shocked, he was losing his, he lost his job, he was losing his house, his wife was out to get the kids. He came home, cleaned things up, and uh, he sent out text, said, Mom, when you see this, I won't be here anymore. I wondered what I would say at the service. Then I thought of Elijah. Remember Ahab, the prophets of Baal, Jezebel, and he runs down to the city after the whole experience on Mount Carmel. And he's there and it's raining and he's tired. I mean, he must have been pooped out running in front of Ahab through that storm. 
and he collapses there and he says, God, I'm done. Let me die. I'm done. Can't do anything more. Somebody, you know, had come and shaken him and said, Jezebel's after you. And uh, then God's angel shows up and says, God wants you. I'm knocking. Get up. Let's go. He gets a meal. He goes up there in the cave. God starts talking to him. He's got two more assignments. Anoint the king and anoint the next prophet, Elisha. He serves God training Elisha. And after a period of time, God airmailed a chariot. He spirits him off to heaven. And when Jesus is facing the cross, when he knows that he's about to sacrifice, who is it that's on the mountain? Who is it that is talking to Jesus and giving him courage? Wow. When I stood up to preach, I said to the audience, I said, I want to tell you something. You know, everybody thinks that uh, not wanting to live is a terrible thing. It's the worst thing you can do, and it's the last thing you do, so you're toast. That's it. I said, I don't believe that. I don't believe, I don't believe that any of us understand how much God loves us. Write that down. When Judas walked out of that room, Spirit of Prophecy says that Jesus, his heart went out after him. He knew what Judas was going to do. He knew that. He knew when he washed his feet what was going on. But his heart, it wouldn't accept it. He wanted him saved. Do you get my point? I said never, never sell Jesus short. If he has Two, he'll run to that son that's left away, gone away. I have a son. I haven't seen him for several years. He drives a truck across America back and forth. I pray. I know my hope. I know my prayer is for Jesus to beat him. I know he can do that. I leave it with him. As I close, I just want to tell you what I think the solution is. You guys, I think, heard Jerry Page, and he handed out some of those books, you know, about uh, Pavel Goya's experiences and so forth. I could tell you yarns of the things that Jesus has done in my life, spared me many times. But I want to say this. I think that the road to Pentecost for us is also through prayer. We are going around, and we're still living the lives that we lived before. Yes, we pray, but, you know, it's mostly let me pray, so-and-so has cancer, and -and so-and-so, and so forth. I believe that the Pentecost prayer is this. Lord, you've gone away. We know that you want to come back. Lord in heaven, you've told us to go. Remember what Jesus, and by the way, this is where I have an issue with some of the folk that, you know, 
they'll come along and say, we need money, we need to do evangelism, we need to do this and that and the other. Jesus said to the disciples, I've told Pastor Stearns this a few times, I said, Jesus said to them, don't take a purse with you. You remember that? Don't take a purse, don't take an extra pair of shoes. If they don't accept you in A, go to B. Keep on trucking. What I'm doing is that I have prayer groups in the morning. I start, I've started at 5.30, but mostly now it's 6, it's 6.30, 7, 7.30. People have to work, I know that. And I have five, six people on this. All we do is use the phones. I don't even have to shave in the morning. I could be in my pajamas. But we go to prayer, and we aren't praying. We aren't praying for all the needs. We're praying that, Lord, please use us some way in your cause. Lord, can I serve you? Lord, would you lead me to somebody? Lay some soul on my heart. And by the way, I think that this whole thing is based on love. If you follow Jesus, uh, uh, his tenure here, his time here, you would see again and again that what he did was love. What he did was love. You run into a need, love. I close with this. There's a lady over on the coast and uh, she's had a rough life. Dad died at age 12 for her. Mother died of cancer when she was 26, married. This lady's gone through cancer surgery. She had some of the same weaknesses that her mother had. She's been divorced, she has three sons. I met her at camp meeting. There was something unusual about her and finally I said, what's your, and she had heard me pray at camp meeting and stuff. She said, you know, I, I know who you are. And I said to her, what's your experience with Jesus? She said to me, I'm all in. I'm all in. I've never forgotten that, that expression. She's on those morning groups, you know. You know what's in her trunk? She's got used Bibles. She's got food there. She's got all kinds of things. If she sees somebody, by the way, she's well-educated and so forth, She'll sit, next to, sit down next to the homeless people. She'll pray with them. She's a tech in a hospital, works hard at night. Jesus wants us to light up and do what he wants. We don't have to, we have to work, I know that, but we have to give Jesus our best. My wife and I were on the coast several years ago. Walked into a McDonald's, there were a couple guys outside, homeless, they seemed to be the reach people or something. And uh, they saw me eating a, a uh, ear of corn. They thought I was eating a hot dog or something and they said, called to me as I went into the McDonald's and said, bring us out something like you have. I said, hey bro, I said, this is an ear of corn. I had it in my, in my pack. <laughs> so I came out, we joked a little bit. The next day, it was Sabbath. My wife and I went to church, there was no meal. We stopped at a safe way to buy a little bread or something, you know, to eat. And here's this guy with his dog 
standing outside Safeway. And uh, he says, hey, I see you again. I said, yes. He said, what about some food? I said, yeah, Sabbath. I gave him $20. He walks in. He picks up some stuff. And he comes out and he hands us $3 back change. He had this dog and the dog had a pack on it. And he fills the pack up with stuff. And finally I said, what are you doing? He says, you know, we have some kettles and all under the boardwalk and stuff. And at night we get together and we cook this great big bowl of soup. And he said, people come along and we feed them. I said to myself, you know what? Man, this guy, he ought to be an Adventist. I was blown away. This lady reminds me of that. I want you each one to look farther and look into your heart and ask yourself, what does God want me to do? It's the easiest thing to start that prayer. Within two weeks' time, within two weeks' time, you're going to begin to say, man, there's a deed here, there's a deed there, let's, let's meet that. That's the way to Pentecost. Being obedient and moving forward. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, somehow, some way, I know that you desire to come back and to take us take us home. The world is not the problem. Lord, your promises in scripture, the spirit of prophecy, they state so clearly that we've got work to do, that we must depend on you totally. We can't work miracles, but we can come closer to you. We can listen to you. We can begin to love. We can begin to work for your salvation. Those apostles, when you spoke to them, when you gave them the blessing, Lord, they walked out, walked away from their homes. They were ready to die. Only John died a natural death even though he was given unnatural punishment. God in heaven, we want you to come. We know that you chose us. We know that you love us. We know that you would run after us in order to take us home with you. May we be faithful. May we as those disciples in Emmaus, may we understand how much you love us, that you walked with us here on earth. We heard your words. Our hearts burned within us. Please, Lord, come soon. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.